Hello, my name is Natalie Allen, the Community Relations Specialist at OpenStax. Today, Anthony Palmiato, OpenStax Editorial Director, Lindsay Josephs, OpenStax Marketing Specialist, and I are excited to work in collaboration with the Mitchelson Institute for Intellectual Property to bring Laura Huffman of Georgia Institute of Technology and Pam Bogdan of Ocean County College and the Mitchelson Foundation to provide a high level understanding of the importance of intellectual property and how to implement the introduction to implement to intellectual property textbook in your STEAM, STEM courses, corporate environment, or law firms. Just a couple of housekeeping issues. We cannot see or hear you, so please use the chat box if you have any questions. Thank you. Lindsay, would you please launch the first poll question? Thank you. How would you best describe your level of understanding on the subject matter of intellectual property? And please just pick one single choice. And, um, and the host and the panelists were not voting, so please put it in the chat box. So here are our results. We see that a lot of you would consider yourselves to be novice, almost equal to the number of you that would consider yourselves to be intermediate um, understanding of IP, and some even advance, a high percentage of advance. Great. Well, let's move on. I'm going to share my screen and provide you with a quick presentation on my screen. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So um, today, again, we'll be hearing from Laura Huffman, who's the lecturer at Georgia Institute of Technology um, and College and University Committee, United States Intellectual Property Alliance, and also from Pam Bogdan. And we'll be looking at who OpenStax is and what OER is, as well as hearing from both Laura and Pam. Please feel free to put questions in the chat box as we go along. OpenStax mission is to improve educational access and learning for everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean learners at all different levels. We provide high quality free instructional materials that follow standard scope and sequence. We are held to industry editorial standards. Um, OpenStax is a nonprofit, nonprofit um, organization and it is part of RICE. OpenStax educational resources follow the five R's, which is what makes it OER, Open Educational Resources. And the five R's are that you can reuse, revise, redistribute, remix, and retain the materials. So let's take a look at the Introduction to Intellectual Property textbook. So I'm going to come out of this. So, and take you right to the textbook. Great, so you should be able to see my screen right now. And what you will see is the landing page. When you take a look at the intellectual property textbook, this is what you would see on OpenStax textbook, on, I'm sorry, OpenStax website. 
Um, and I will show you quickly the book details where you can get access to it online. You can download a PDF or you can order a print copy from our partners, Xanadu, through Amazon. And then I want to get right into the instructor resources. What you'll find in the instructor resources are materials that are meant to support you within your classroom, like the cartridges, as well as the OER hub, video series, a number of wonderful resources, um, as well as assessment questions right from Mitchelson. So I'm going to stop here and um, introduce Laura Huffman. Laura is an associate in the Atlanta office of King and Spalding and a member of the firm's intellectual property counseling practice. At Georgia Tech, Laura also teaches technology, law, policy, and management in the School of Public Policy and CS4010, Introduction to Computer Law in the School of Computer Science as well at Georgia Tech. Laura, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm very excited to talk about um, the reasons that your students would want to study intellectual property. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. There we go. So why intellectual property? If you look at what the world um, used to make money in the 1700s and early 1800s, it was all focused around agriculture. In the early 1800s to the 1900s, we moved into the industrial economy. You started to see mass production, people moving to urban areas um, because that's where the jobs were, those kinds of things. But since the late 1900s to now, we've really been in the knowledge economy. And when I say the knowledge economy, the knowledge economy revolves around intellectual property. We like to think of intellectual property as sort of the air we breathe that makes our current um, economy possible. So when I say intellectual property, what do I mean? It's a creation of the human mind that has commercial value and receives legal protection. And so when you talk to students about intellectual property, you'll be explaining to them what all of those things mean. But it's just another form of property, like real estate, like your personal property, your computer, your clothes, or um, anything like that. It can be bought, it can be sold, um, you can buy and sell pieces of it, um, but it is an intangible form of property. Um, some of the things that get protected with intellectual property, here we have um, some devices and processes. I've got a little video that we'll give a try and see if it works. So all of the things we saw in just that little short clip can be protected by intellectual property. You can protect the collar that they were making. You can protect the machine that's used to make, that make the collar. You can protect the process itself. All of those things are intellectual property. Here's some of our favorite brands. Those are also intellectual property. One of the things that people often get surprised by is that intellectual property covers works of art. A lot of times when you think of intellectual property, people immediately go to technology, patents, those kinds of things. Intellectual property is just as important for your liberal arts students as it is for your technical students. And we'll talk about that when we talk about what Georgia Tech is doing. Another form of intellectual property that people don't often think of is recipes. Um, those are absolutely trade secrets and they need to be protected. You think about some of your famous um, fast food places and, and what they have, and, you know, the Colonel and his 11 herbs and spices or, um, you know, pretty much everything. That's intellectual property just as much as those technologies that we were looking at on the previous slide. Why do your students care about this? Because no matter what they are in, no matter what field they're in, they are going to generate 
and use intellectual property. Whether you're writing a story, you're creating a video, you're taking a photograph, creating a sculpture, starting a company, whatever you're doing, you will be generating and using intellectual property. If they're going to go into a business career, they'll be looking at their company's intellectual property portfolio. What do we want to protect? How do we want to protect it? What do other people have that we might need a license to or that we might need to stay away from? Are there people that we want to collaborate with because they have intellectual property? Again, it's critical to the current economy. If your students are going to start their own business, they'll often rely on their intellectual property for funding. And then, of course, if they really get into it, there's a number of IP careers that are available. You can be an intellectual property lawyer if you have a technical degree. You can be a patent agent, which is a great career that doesn't require a law degree. You can be a technical specialist. You can be a licensing manager. You can work for the USPTO as an examiner. So there's all manner of ways that intellectual property can become a full-time career. Now, what are we doing at Georgia Tech? So I've been involved in the Georgia Tech Intellectual Property Advisory Board since 2016. And back about that time, there were a group of people, and, and I'll brag on them because I wasn't part of it, that took a look at where do we need to take the university to be um, positioned for what's going to be coming in the future. And this is a quote from our president about how Atlanta is becoming a hub of innovation. And because intellectual property is what makes innovation possible, we decided that we wanted to make Georgia Tech the number one intellectual property university in the entire country. So we've been working at that for several years. And uh, one of the programs that we have in place to accomplish that is this intellectual property certificate. So this is something that students can earn. It requires 12 semester hours of classes and it's an interdisciplinary certificate. We'll look at the classes that are available in a minute. It is hosted in the School of Public Policy. And because intellectual property is so important to any Thing that people are going to be doing in the current economy. It's helpful to anyone who wants to understand what are the laws and policies that govern intellectual property. So for students who are going to go into careers in business who need to recognize the value of IP, the certificate serves them. Any student who plans to go on to law school to become an intellectual property lawyer, careers as patent agents, as I've talked about, um, those are for technical degrees only, but those are very, very powerful um, career paths for the student who wants to stay in the technical area. And then for any student who wants to get into government to help develop policies in intellectual property and innovation. And we have a full slate of classes that we offer. As I mentioned, it's 12 semester hours in total. Um, the class that I'm currently teaching, Technology Law Policy and Management, is the required class. It's sort of a baseline that tells you um, what is intellectual property and why it's important. And then we have a number, number of other classes that our students can choose from. So you can see we have classes in um, our liberal arts area, our history of uh, technology and science, our literature, media, and communications, public policy. Um, but then we move into our business school, um, and we even have classes in the engineering school so that students who want to take this get this certificate, but who need to get electives in engineering as well can do that. So um, these classes that we have here include um, the history of uh, technology and science, um, looks at the ways that courts, legislatures, and regulatory agencies um, have responded to challenges uh, presented by new technologies. Um, the Supreme Court, pretty much every session now is hearing at least one key intellectual property case. Um, our literature, media, and communications case looks at the effect of power structures and digitization. Um, the pre-law seminar is aimed at creating um, success in law school and good lawyers coming out of Georgia Tech. Um, the management class looks at the generation, commercialization, protection, and adoption of innovation. Um, science, technology, and public policy looks at the relation between science, technology, and government. Our internet law class looks at 
privacy, um, freedom of speech, regulation, and crimes on the internet, all of which are you know, in the headlines every day. Um, we have an advanced uh, science and technology policy class, intellectual property transactions that looks at contracts, licenses, joint development, and joint ventures. Um, and then patent preparation and process is taught by instructors who are practicing patent lawyers. So this helps our students who want to go into that patent agent career get a head start. Um, um, Natalie mentioned the um, introduction to computer law class that I'm teaching. That's in our School of Computer Science, and that really looks at how intellectual property affects all aspects of computer science. So what if you're interested in it, but you don't wanna go after a certificate? Or what if you don't even know enough to know that you're interested? What are some other things that we have going on at Georgia Tech? Um, one of the things is a guest lecture program that we started back in 2016, when we had this goal of making Georgia Tech the number one intellectual property university. Um, and our goal is that no student leaves Georgia Tech without hearing at least one lecture in intellectual property. So we find professors who want to host us. It might be a capstone class. It might be a um, PhD level seminar. Um, and we have active practitioner, practitioners in the Atlanta area come in and talk to students about intellectual property. What is it? Why is it important? And, and what can they do with it? And then outside of our students, we have courses that are available for our general community. Um, one of our proudest examples is we uh, just recently this summer partnered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office for a six week intellectual property summary series that was available to anyone who wanted to participate online. So in conclusion, um, like I mentioned, intellectual property is the equivalent of the air we breathe in the current knowledge economy. Um, students of all disciplines, whether it be liberal arts, business, technology, computer science, should understand IP and how it affects them. Um, we're teaching IP in multiple avenues, and I'm happy to take any of your questions at this point. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> we think it's awesome, too. If you have questions through the program, we, we can address them later. I don't want to hold people up. So um, thank you. Natalie, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to introduce Pam. I think you're on mute. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, Laura. Um, before we get started, Pam, I'm going to ask Lindsay to launch the second poll question. Have you previously taught lessons or classes on intellectual property? I'll just wait a couple of seconds. Ah, interesting. Okay. So many of you are saying no. Okay, great. All right. So we're going to move on. And um, Pam is a faculty member at Ocean County College and teaches engineering courses, student success courses, general ed technology and math. Pam is also a part of Mitchelson's intellectual property educator in residence initiative, which positions her very uniquely to speak to using the introduction to intellectual property curriculum in the classroom. Pam, thank you for being here. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. <clears throat> All right, let me uh, first start by saying 
Um, being involved in the IP educator in residence program through the Michelson Institute has been an invaluable tool. Uh, not only the experience working with my panelists uh, or fellow uh, educators, but also just the support and the materials that are provided both through Michelson, um, as well as extending out into NACI as well, uh, into the entrepreneurial. And so um, just, uh, I hope that you'll be able to go to some of the resources. We have some of the Michelson resources available as well, um, along with the textbook. Um, all is just a great showcase of how much work and effort uh, all of these organizations are making uh, to make intellectual property um, accessible to everyone as it should be, as Laura sort of pointed out. So uh, what I'm hoping today uh, to show you is some of my more modest efforts to integrate it into the School of Engineering um, and our programs here. We have uh, at OCC, we have a department that's the Engineering and Industrial Technical Studies Department. Uh, you could think of industrial technical studies more as your sort of classical engineering technology path, uh, but it's a little bit broader than that. Uh, but that's sort of the, the programs that are, are in this department. And uh, let me talk about some of the goals and, and what I'm gonna do throughout this talk is just give you some scenarios of how I've worked, um, uh, how we've worked some of this IP curriculum into various courses. So from an IP uh, perspective, uh, you know, the first thing is really just awareness. Uh, what is intellectual property? <clears throat> and, maybe, and maybe this is a good stopping point. Um, I joined full-time the academic world about four years ago. Prior to that, I worked in uh, corporate America and, and I started my career uh, at Bell Labs, certainly a cornerstone of generating intellectual property. Um, and so I was uh, just had the fabulous experience of being around uh, intellectual property for many decades and the importance of it. Um, but not everybody has that. Uh, not everybody has that opportunity. And so being able to make sure that all of our students are aware of intellectual property, what it means in terms of both generating intellectual property. Um, which is very exciting as an engineer that, you know, as an engineer getting a patent really feels like that's validation as an engineer. Um, and so that's the creation of the content and where it goes. Uh, but also as we work and, and create solutions, being aware of not violating others uh, intellectual property, whether that be a patent, uh, copyright, uh, trademarks, all those kinds of things, um, because uh, engineers are asked to solution not only the technology, but many times the, the business solutions around them, marketing, all that kind of stuff. And so being aware of intellectual property is an important aspect of, of the jobs that we do. Um, we need to emphasize uh, IP and, and we go ahead and we make sure that it's revisited in all of the core classes. And then finally, make sure that they value uh, good management. And that they value uh, good IP management as seen through experiential learning activities. And I'm gonna walk through some of the examples of each of these. So in our student success seminar, we now have a student success seminar that's specific to our engineering and technology majors. And the first formal design project that they do uh, kicks off with using the Michelson short videos on intellectual property. Uh, what is a patent? What is copyright? Uh, what are trademarks? And then also um, uh, we look out at the Creative Commons at the license chooser. Um, licensing and these licensing options, we see, uh, you know, I became familiar with these licensing options as uh, I come from a telecommunications background. And so much of telecommunications equipment is going to open source and licensing certainly is a, a key component of that in terms of how it economically works. And, but it's being applied in many, many more areas as intellectual property um, becomes harder and harder to sort of keep at a proprietary level. So how do you manage and still make uh, economic sense out of things that are out in the open? And so that's an important aspect. But again, 
right on uh, their first semester. Uh, they're doing their first design project and it, and it kicks off with making sure uh, that they understand uh, what is intellectual property and, and sort of the four dimensions or really five dimensions. Okay. Then we continue in that class uh, looking at copyrights because one of the assignments they have is to design a logo. Uh, the primary uh, uh, goals of this uh, activity is twofold. One is for creativity, right? Uh, it's community. Um, we try to, we break the students into their various engineering disciplines because we support more than one engineering. We have civil engineers, we have electrical engineers, we have industrial engineers, we have mechanical engineers, and then we have sort of a handful of, of others, maybe aerospace or chemical or biomedical uh, that are pursuing the first half of their um, bachelor's degree with us. And so we break them into discipline groups and have them design a logo. And that certainly brings them into the conversation about copyrights and, and the basic guidance that we give them, right? We're, we're swamping them with lots of knowledge in this new course. We're sort of giving them a view of everything engineering, which is a very daunting task. But if we can give them some key nuggets that'll keep them safe, then that's important. So in this particular case, you know, they're basically told, you know, this is what you need to think about when you're thinking about using someone else's art. You can use it for your own personal, right? Which is typically what they're doing with these t-shirts. But be careful if you're doing something that might cause commercial damage to somebody. And really it's basically, if you feel like you're generating a knockoff, in other words, if you're knocking off from somebody else's very visible um, logo or image or things like that, then you have the potential of doing commercial damage to them because you're tarnishing what is a very well-recognized image. And so they start to understand, they start to understand those things. This, believe it or not, creating those t-shirts ends up um, giving them entryway into their first manufacturing class because we use a, a vinyl cutter, which is a computer driven, um, you know, manufacturing device. And then they learn some, some materials out of that um, because they're doing the heat press of the vinyl. So again, how can you easily work intellectual property into the activities that you're doing? It, it's really much easier than you think it is. Um, and with even, even just using the textbook, because the textbook is wonderful, and we'll look at that, and, and I know we're going to look at that probably a little bit later. It's put in such small and simple vignettes um, that it's easy to sort of grab little pieces and, and work it into, into, the, into your courses here and there and everywhere. So most of our engineering courses also include um, some sort of either common project or large project. For those classes where we use the common project, it starts with a brainstorming activity for their group project. And that, and that brainstorming, again, re-emphasizes the need to think about the various aspects of intellectual property, whether it's patents or copyrights or licenses or trademarks or things like that. It, you know, we want them to make sure that they're thinking about that. The other thing too, is those same sort of guidelines. Um, we, we have a pretty significant focus on doing outreach back into our, our county, back into the K through 12. And so this same design challenge also is offered to our high school and our middle school students. And, and we include briefing, that, briefing them with the kickoff and say, this is how you should kick it off. Um, um, you know, do your brainstorming and the you know, intellectual property should also be thought about uh, during those times as well. So we're not only um, giving this to our students, but it's getting messaged into sort of the funnel of students that will be coming into us in the future. So they come already IP aware uh, prior to getting to us on, on their first day of, of classes. And again, continuing with the outreach activities, um, we not only are doing K through 12 outreach, but we are a community college and it's our goal to become a value added resource to the rest of the community. And so we do things like talks. And this is an example of one uh, last year in support, of, or this year, because it's hard to remember what 
what year it is, uh, in celebration of World Intellectual Property Day, um, we used the resources that were provided by Michelson, these um, series of wonderful uh, scenarios that walk the audience through thinking about, oh, here's a real world, real accessible scenario that I can imagine myself being in. What are the issues or what are the topics or what are the decisions around intellectual property that have to be done uh, for that particular scenario? And you can see that for that particular topic, it's not only what, what did we, um, uh, we make it, but when it hit out in social media, this particular uh, postings of this talk uh, more than quadrupled our normal response to our social media postings. So you know that not only is this something that we feel is of value, but the community at large is feeling that it's of value as well. Student participation in non-disclosure agreement. I, I sort of put this in just to hopefully make all of you chuckle because I really can't talk about it because it actually really is a non-disclosure project. Uh, but how cool is that for a student in their first or second year of college to say and put on their resume that they're already working on a project that is strategic enough that it's being wrapped in a non-disclosure agreement. In other words, trade secrets are being made. Um, that's phenomenal. Uh, and so, again, getting students to understand the intellectual property and the management of that, because each of the students participating in this had to sign the non-disclosure agreement. Um, you know, and hopefully, from a technologist's perspective, in the future, they may be pushing the envelope in different technologies and, and working these sort of uh, situations with, with either the company they work for, the companies they're forming, uh, but it starts to get that sort of whole uh, ecosystem of what intellectual property is uh, in front of them. I'm going to close with just giving you a list of some great resources. Obviously, the textbook that we're here to uh, talk about today, fabulous resource. Um, and I tried to highlight some chapters just, just to sort of give you a tease. Really, every chapter is good. Uh, but when you look at it, it's an easy read for your students. The style that it's written in is uh, very familiar for our, you know, our modern student. It's not overwhelming. It's not burdensome in terms of getting through it. It gets to the key points. It gets them what they need to know, and it moves them on to the next chapter. Um, so uh, again, I highly encourage you. These are some of the ones that I may use in some of my classes. In fact, I'm just you know, I gave you some examples, but just today I was working with my prototyping class and obviously intellectual property is a huge topic in terms of prototyping. And they were given an assignment to look at their design and figure out what the issues are, uh, potential opportunities for patenting, copywriting, trademarking um, and licensing for their design and have that open discussion um, on the discussion board in, in, in the course. So um, all of those, and then to use the textbook as a reference to support sort of their answers. And then down at the bottom, again, these are the videos that I shared with you. Um, these are sort of short, uh, very introductory, but they get the discussion going, they get the awareness, and then you can follow up with other resources, other more, more detailed resources uh, to be able to um, sort of close that um, learning loop with awareness, practice, and then sort of mastery. Um, but the, all of these resources really can, can sort of get the ball rolling, get the students, you know, eyes open to intellectual property, and then, um, and then dive into the, into the textbook for reinforcement of that. That is what I had to share with all of you. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Let me see if I can stop sharing. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share all this with you. It, um, like I said, I, I have had the wonderful opportunity to be in and around intellectual property for almost 44 decades. Um, <laughs> it's been a while. Um, and it's just a really exciting space to be uh, in, uh, especially as a technologist, 
Um, you know, and I know that's one of the things that we find is that um, many times when we look at it academically, we look at it from either a legal or a business perspective in terms of intellectual property. But I, I just want to share this one story with you. Um, at one point, uh, when I was a technical manager, uh, we were in the process of a post merger and we were the acquired asset. We were not the acquiring asset. And when you're the acquired asset, you always have to sort of justify your existence, right? And I turned back to my team and said, look, we're, everybody on this team is gonna file a patent disclosure. I mean, I was lucky I had a, I worked for a company that supported a very aggressive patenting uh, program. But I said, everybody on this team is going to submit a patent disclosure. Doesn't mean it's going to go to a patent. In fact, the good news is we actually ended up with a couple of patents out of it. But the idea is that is a very tangible valuation of the contribution of a technical team. And so it's important that not only are students creating that value, but they are learning how to translate that into those monetized valuations of their technical contribution. And it's really, it's really important that they sort of get in that mindset. And if the first hurdle that I had to get over with my team was, look, I know you did not invent the light bulb, but you solved something uniquely. That potentially is patentable. And, and I, think that's, I think that's sort of the step one. But again, that's just an example of, of why in the world of STEM and STEM for STEM students, why intellectual property is important. Because guess what? We got really aggressive, not only in my small group, but in my organization as a whole in terms of submitting those. And before long, the acquiring organizations went, wow, you guys really are valuable. We see that because there was tangible measure of how much contribution we were making. So I just wanted to share that story with folks because I, I think it, it, you know, many times, you know, as, as technologists or STEM people, we feel like, oh, what we did is good, but putting the IP around it and the documentation of the IP around it is, is a measurable uh, way and an objective way of showing that value. So. Any questions? Actually, there was a question put in the chat box and it came from Jelani. And the question was, if both you and Laura could share any common questions about IP that you tend to get from your students. Also, are there any particular areas of IP that are usually um, that usually capture your students' interests? For example, patents versus copyright. You wanna oh, go for it? Sure, sure, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, I mean, I would actually say their questions are all over the map. I don't know that there's necessarily any common questions, but one of the issues that's kind of a, a biggest importance right now, particularly in the computer science and engineering field is the issue of trade secrets. And what is your knowledge as a human being compared to what are your company's trade secrets and how, when you go to work for the next company, do you manage to stay out of trouble by using only your knowledge and not your former company's trade secrets? So um, there's a lot of object question or object examples there of people who have done that wrong um, and, and that really tends to get people's attention. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen some interesting solutions to that. Um, you know, sometimes there's a cooling off period because technology these days moves so fast that there's sort of a non-compete for a while, what I would call the, the, the cooling off. But yeah, that, that is a really big issue. I mean, I, Sometimes I feel like I'm still under my original IP because Bell Labs had, they owned everything. That was, that was what we signed, but that was back in what I would sign that in the eighties um, when this wasn't as prominent of, of an issue. Uh, yeah. 
the, the, I tend to get questions about patents. Uh, for engineers, patents are typically their most, uh, most prominent IP issue. Um, I get questions about, can I patent something? Um, I get questions about, hey, I got this idea. Can you help me patent it? Um, I also get community questions about the same, same sort of thing, about how can I patent it and or how can I uh, find funding to take either my patentable idea or an idea that I've already patented and get it to the right places. So um, actually funding is, is probably one of the bigger issues that I see around of patents. Yeah, and that, that actually brings up, um, there was a question that was, was put in the Q&A um, that I think maybe we could both address, Pam. Um, and that is, at what point do you have to consider the valuation of the IP? Um, and I think that, um, you know, that really depends on what IP you're looking at and what you want to do with it. Um, you need to, you know, particularly if you're going after registration, like with a patent, um, you need to have a sense that going after the patent um, will be worth the money that you're going to spend doing it. Um, I, one of my co-teachers is in-house counsel at um, a, a large multinational company. And she says, anytime they want to patent an invention on a global basis, she budgets $60,000. So that is not something that you wanna go into lightly. Um, the United States Patent and Trademark Office does have some resources available for individual inventors to, to try to help them. Um, you know, to, to patent their invention without having to incur that expense. Um, I'm very proud of Georgia Lawyers for the Arts who um, took that on a few years ago um, when uh, the United States went from a first to invent to a first to file system. Georgia Lawyers for the Arts has been helping individual inventors in the state of Georgia. And right now we have the number one pro bono program with the USPTO. So that's pretty exciting. But um, you know, that, those are the kind of things you need to, to look at. And then you need to look at, if I try to protect it another way that's not so expensive, will it stay protected? Is this something I can keep as a trade secret? Um, will a copyright be sufficient? Um, so there, there's just, you know, there's a whole business analysis that has to go into that. So Pam, I, I know you've wrestled with those issues as well. Yeah, and I would say those numbers that you quote, um, yeah, somewhere between 40 to 60 is typically what I'm seeing with regards to patents, if it's significant. Um, and even, even small uh, inventors, that's about the numbers that I'm seeing. And, and that's, that's not chump change, that's, that's significant. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's more than the car that I drive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then, and then what you do with it, because I think people view, hey, I get the patent and then the world's gonna open up to me. Um, and I think that's the other thing is that if you are going down that path of patenting, you have to think about two or three steps beyond that to say, all right, and then do I have the right people, the right partners, the right investors lined up to, you know, get return on that significant investment. So, yeah. Okay. And then there's another question. What's the rate of business started from students with the IP protection on, I think he means maybe in place, not on place or in place. I don't know if I can actually speak to the rate because um, I, I don't have those statistics and I haven't looked at them. Um, I, I, I think you got to look at sort of what is a particular academic field or an academic program training and sort of socializing their students towards from an engineering perspective, we, we typically aren't training and socializing engineers to become standalone companies. Although I think that's gonna change a little bit more. I think the economy, this is just me speaking off of my own thoughts. 
I think the economy is going to move towards smaller units and less in terms of uh, large corporate headings. But it, but again, I think you have to sort of look at what the discipline is. Um, I think we encourage more of that out of the schools of business. Um, but I don't see it. I, I'm not sure I see it as much coming out of uh, uh, at, le at least the schools and the programs I'm dealing with. I, I think the bigger colleges, and I know when I, I actually, we were laughing, I'm an alum from Georgia Tech. Um, there's a significant legacy of Georgia Tech being entrepreneurial and starting and launching. I see that in my alumni magazine all the time. Um, so again, I, th I think it just sort of uh, has to be what that particular institution and those programs are, are sort of encouraging and enabling. Because as we go back a moment ago, they got to get to resources and they got to get to something to be able to launch and, 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 and get those entrepreneurial efforts going. I think we all want to help enable that because I think the economy needs to um, sort of be retooled a little bit, but I don't think we're completely there yet. So from the Georgia Tech perspective, as, as Pam mentioned, we have huge support for entrepreneurial activity. Um, you know, every single student is encouraged to look at, uh, do you have something that you can turn into a business? We have a um, institution called CreateX that exists to help students become entrepreneurial. Um, we have multiple business incubators um, and we're, we really are you know, pushing our students to look at, are they able to do that? Um, and one of, one of the things, you know, back to the question about what percentage of businesses launch with the IP in place? Well, they've all got the IP in place. Um, it, it's, it's there. It's a question of whether it's protected and how it's protected. So your trade secrets exist from the moment you create them, right? Your copyrighted materials, like your software, um, you know, your source code, that exists from the moment you create it. That's your copyrighted material. You may or may not have um, registered it yet, but, it, but the copyright exists. So it's really only the, the patents, I would say, that are, are something that you look at, you know, kind of more has that, you know, have you made it through the patentability process? Do you have a grant from the USPTO? Um, but, but the rest of the intellectual property is there. And, and that's one of our goals is to help people understand that it's a whole system. It's, it's not just one thing. I don't see any other questions in the chat box nor um, in the queue right now. I want to make sure no one has any other questions. It doesn't look like it. Okay. I cannot say thank you enough to Laura and Pam for being here with us. It's absolutely fascinating. And also thank you to Rochelle and Jelani from Mitchelson. Um, Mitchelson has done a wonderful job of partnering with OpenStax and putting together this beautiful textbook. And again, if you go to our website, you can download the textbook for free um, to get access to the textbook as well as to the instructor and student resources. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good day. Thank you.